hi, this is Dr. John Bennett uh, from Miami Beach with Neurosurgical TV. We have part two uh, of uh, the AFAN uh, lectures on normally happens on Friday. Uh, let me uh, introduce the panelists first before we start. Turn over to Dr. Cabulo, the presenter. Hello, Serge. Could you please introduce yourself again? Hi, Dr. Bennett. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Serge Dimba. I'm a uh, final year neurosurgical resident in Zimbabwe. Thank you. Okay, welcome. He's got a great background there, too. Okay. Hello, hello Marco. We're going to teach him how to do it, too. Hi, Marco. Hey, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Marco Meroni. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon in uh, North Italy. Hello, everybody. Yeah, hey, welcome, uh, Marco. Uh, Nathalie? Once again, let me unmute you there. I don't know if you stepped away or not. Matt, go ahead. No, not yet. Hello, everyone. I'm Natalie Pistel. I'm a medical physician. I'm a general physician in Cameroon. I'm a member of AFAN. Okay, welcome, Natalie. And Sibarshi, could you please introduce yourself again, please? Hello, everybody. My name is Sibarshi Samakandi. I'm a final year, final year neurosurgical resident at the uh, University of Zimbabwe. Okay, welcome. Uh, in Phoenix, could you please, can you hear me okay? Could you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Kabila. Go ahead, Kabila. I'm, I'm sorry. In Phoenix or... Dr. Kabila. Dr. Kabila, can you introduce yourself, please? Once more. Hello, John, please. Can you let in uh, Ulrich? Okay. Ulrich is online. Okay. Yes. Can you promote him, please? Hello, Dr. Kabila. Yes, Dr. Kabila, can you introduce yourself, please? Once yeah, more. so... Uh, I said earlier, I'm Dr. Kabila. I'm a general surgeon based in Zambia. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. You. In Phoenix, could you please introduce yourself? Piero, Piero, can you introduce yourself? Okay. Well, okay. Well, I guess we can't. Well, we'll introduce Ulrich when he comes in. Okay, Dr. Gabolo, thank you very much. Oh, there's Ulrich. Could you please introduce yourself when you just got in? <laughs> Hello, John. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Ulrich Sidney here, um, research associate at the PGSSC at Harvard. Nice to join you. Yeah, he's walking the streets of Boston. <laughs> Let's welcome Ulrich. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Okay, Dr. Gabolo, thank you very much, and it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Kabulo. I'm a final year neurosurgeon resident at the University of Zimbabwe. I'm uh, originally from uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. So thank you, Dr. Natalie, for your beautiful presentation. I'm just going to complete her presentation. Uh, she was uh, talking about uh, thalamus, the anatomy of thalamus. I will just talk about uh, thalamic gliomas, uh, pediatric thalamic gliomas. Uh, so, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see you're, you're starting to screen share. There you go. Okay. You're going to make it bigger there. Okay. okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. I don't know if you want okay. to make it bigger yeah. or not. Okay. Let me try to make it big. Oh, yeah. okay. Huh? Hey. <laughs> okay, okay. Can you... That's fine, Dr. Kabula, if you want to go ahead with that. It's okay. Let me try yeah, to make certainly. it easy. Okay, well, there's no hurry. Mm. Oop, I think we fell off there. And don't worry, we can edit this out. Yes. Can you see it now? Nah, there we go. There we go. Perfect. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Looks okay. perfect. Thank you so much. Perfect. So I'm just going to talk about the uh, overview of uh, thalamic gliomas in uh, in children. Uh, so I was uh, inspired by Dr. Natalie uh, after she presented on uh, the anatomy of the thalamus. So projected thalamic gliomas, they are... They arise as primary gliomas, sometimes as a secondary gliomas. Uh, when they are secondary, they are coming from adjacent uh, surrounding structures, like including the cerebral hemispheres, uh, the caudate nucleus, 
uh, the brain stem and the pineal gland. So the deep central location of the thalamus makes surgical treatment of these tumors difficult without significant patient morbidity and mortality. So it's very difficult to reach the thalamus, very difficult to reach the thalamic tumors because once you go in, there is a morbidity, there is mortality with the um, following surgeries. So even though thalamic gliomas are rare, they account for 1% uh, to 1.5% of uh, all central nervous system tumors. Both low-grade and high-grade uh, have been described in the thalamus. So like we know all of us, low-grades are well-circumscribed lesions, and the high grade, they are diffuse, they are infiltrating gliomas. Uh, although pilocystic astrocytoma classically okay in the hypothalamic and also in the optic pathway, they can also okay uh, in the thalamus. But when they okay in the thalamus, they are unilateral. So high grade fibrillary astrocytoma also okay uh, in this region. And uh, usually they are unilateral. Uh, with the little involvement of the visual pathway. And uh, there is also another variant called bilateral infiltrating astrocytomas, which are very rare, uh, very rare variant of uh, fibrillary astrocytomas. There are lesions in the in the bilateral thalami, so you will see in both uh, thalami on the right side and the left side, but they have a very poor uh, outcome due to their intrinsic aggressive uh, biology and the difficulty in attaining adequate surgical debulking of the tumor, resulting in mass effect uh, on the, the thalamus. So about epidemiology, thalamic gliomas are very rare. So we have many tumors which can occur on the thalamus. They are, but the majority of them, they are gliomas on the thalamus. And the true incident is unknown so far. Why? Because it's difficult to differentiate those tumors from tumors arising from surrounding structures. There are tumors which can arise from adjacent structures and we can confuse them with the thalamic uh, gliomas. So that's why the true incident is unknown. But people are estimating that thalamic uh, tumors, thalamic gliomas, they, um, they are like 1 to 5% of all central nervous system tumors. So from a surgical viewpoint, primary thalamic tumors may be classified into three groups. Now we are talking about primary thalamic tumors, not uh, the other tumors coming from surrounding structures. So we have uh, fewer thalamic tumors. These are uh, the tumors which arise from the thalamus and which may spread out uh, uh, from uh, which spread from thalamus to surrounding structures. There are also thalamopedunculate tumors, uh, those that arise at the junction of uh, these two structures between thalamus and the superior peduncle. And also we have primary bilateral thalamic tumors. So there is a study which was done in Paris in 2007. This was a retrospective analysis of uh, 69 children with thalamic tumors. So in this study, 32 patients had low-grade thalamic tumors and 22 had high-grade tumors. And the remaining 15 had nine bilateral thalamic and six thalamopedunculate tumors. So it was found that low-grade lesions had statistically improved survival rates, particularly when patients had the symptom duration longer than two months and tumor excision greater than 90%. According to the pathology, uh, primary thalamic gliomas include pilocystic astrocytoma, which is a low-grade astrocytoma, uh, classified as a grade one by the World Health Organization. There is the second one is fibrillary astrocytoma, which is grade two, but according to WHO, these tumors are classified, are graded from grade two to grade four, and they are prone to malignant. So the third one is bilateral infiltrating astrocytoma, which is a rare variant of uh, fibrillary astrocytoma. So this bilateral, bilateral infiltrating astrocytoma, they are extremely rare, though they are benign. 
but they are well uh, differentiated, but they carry a very poor prognosis due to thalamic nuclear involvement and uh, inadequate surgical resection. So these tumors, the bilateral infiltrating astrocytomas, up to now, it is unknown whether these bilateral tumors arise from one side of the thalamic nuclei and cross the midline to other, or they arise independently from tumors in the sub-ependymal region uh, of the third ventricle. So, so far, it's not clear. So, diagnosis, clinical signs and symptoms of thalamic tumors include weakness, uh, signs of raised ICP, like uh, headache, uh, vomiting and whatever we know about uh, red ICP. You might get also motor deficit, like Dr. Mba was also emphasizing about this. Uh, sometimes you get seizures, though the thalamus is deep-seated in the brain, because we know that seizures are coming from uh, cortical irritation. But you can also get seizures, and 30% of patients present with epilepsy, uh, and 12% of patients have movement disorders. Uh, as tremors and dystonia. So ADAPT can present with visual deficit, and in some cases, patients present with mental deterioration and uh, personality change. In addition, clinical presentation is correlated with tumor location as uh, any other tumor in the central nervous system. It depends on the location of the tumor. Uh, specifically, tumors on the anterolateral thalamus are associated with sensation deficit and paresis, while those on the posterior medial thalamus are associated with the early hydrocephalus because they are medial, they are compressing the third ventricle, then you get obstructive hydrocephalus. Then the presentation can also include deficit in vision, like I was saying before, such as uh, amyanopsia, uh, then you can get a mitotic poorly reactive pupils and ipsilateral oculomotor palsy. So radiologically, I'm just going to talk about MRI uh, in details. Patients typically, they undergo MRI prior to treatment. And others, those who are not receiving surgical management, they also undergo MRI for follow-up. And thalamic lesion, usually they are heterogeneous, uh, often cystic with calcification. Uh, and there is also edema perilesion or edema, and um, this contrast enhancement on T1 and T2 weighted MRI. So, but the most common neuroimaging findings is hydrocephalus. And imaging is also very useful to distinguish between pilocystic astrocytoma and infiltrative fibrillary astrocytoma. This is an image showing uh, a pilocystic astrocytoma. As you can see, pilocystic astrocytoma is a low-grade glioma. It's well circumscribed. Uh, it's a solid tumor. Uh, some uh, are cystic, like you can see this lesion, it's cystic. It has a cystic component within it, and uh, they take contrast. This, this is T1 uh, post-contrast image showing a pilocystic astrocytoma. They tend to display surrounding structures rather than invading them like a principle in neurosurgery, once you get a, um, a benign tumor, it is pushing, it is displacing surrounding structures. But if it's a malignant tumor, it is invading uh, the structures. So this is uh, infiltrative fibrillary astrocytoma. If you remember my previous presentation, I talk about uh, WHO classification of central nervous system tumors was the latest classification, the 2016 classification. We were discussing about the uh, astrocytomas. There's grade two astrocytoma, which is called diffuse astrocytoma. And um, for, from the old classification, it had two, three components, the fibrillary astrocytoma, the protoplasmic astrocytoma, and the chemistocytic. But Fibrillary and um, protoplasmic were removed from the classification. In the 2016 classification is not there. But still, 20, 2007 classification is still valid up to now 
because it's histological. It's not everywhere where you can do genetic, where you can do molecular classification. So here in the thalamic, according to the 2007 classification, it is still the fibrillary astrocytoma, which is common in, uh, in uh, thalamus. So the, the infiltrated fibrillary astrocytomas, they can be benign or malignant. So they can range from grade two to grade four astrocytomas, the gliomas. So they are hyper intense on T2 and on flare, but they are hypo intense on T1. So high grade, they, they tend to, to extend to adjacent structures and also uh, they take contrast. That's uh, high grade. So it's like in, in, in thalamus, you can get a glioblastoma. That glioblastoma can be either primary or it can be secondary. When it is secondary, it means it's coming from surrounding structures. It's a glioblastoma of uh, uh, something surrounding the thalamus and affecting the thalamus. Or it can be primary. Uh, what we call de novo glioblastoma on the thalamus, but it is very, very rare uh, to get glioblastoma on the thalamus, but cases are there. So there is this variant, the bithalamic infiltrating astrocytomas, uh, which present as a symmetrical T2 high, uh, signal, hyper intensity in both thalamus. Like you can see this image, this is a CT scan, which is showing uh, bithalamic infiltrating astrocytoma, which is uh, IPO to isodense. And the next is uh, an MRI T2. So these astrocytomas, the bithalamic infiltrating, they are IP intense on T2. Remember, I was saying they, it is unclear so far to know either they are coming from both uh, thalamus and joining, or it just from one thalamus and crossing the midline going to other side. So far, it's still uh, unknown. This is oligodendroglioma. Uh, on CT down here, you see it's a well-defined mass with calcification. The white part is calcification and uh, minimal, very minimal uh, surrounding edema. But on, uh, on MRI, they say it's less typical with either relatively uniform contrast enhancement or non-enhancement at all. So usually they say it's very rare to get oligodendroglioma from the thalamus as a primary tumor coming from the thalamus. Usually it comes from the surrounding structures and also affecting the thalamus. In terms of management, surgical management uh, is individualized and depends on the pathology logic grade of the tumor. So you have to grade, is it a low grade or a high grade? Two, it depends on the location of the tumor. And also the last one, it depends on neuroimaging characteristics such as vascular involvement and enhancement. So the natural history is uh, unpredictable, a natural history of thalamic gliomas. So the optimal management of these tumors is, uh, in children is poorly defined. Traditionally, thalamic tumors were considered inoperable because of their proximity to clinical to critical structures and the risk of major post-operative morbidity. However, with better neuroimaging and intraoperative technology, surgical resection of some thalamic tumors has, has been achievable with acceptable morbidity. So, like I was saying, the correlation between extent of resection and prognosis of a particular tumor is of considerable importance. Um, and however, in low-grade thalamic tumors, radical resection can be curative. And consensus with the literature for low-grade astrocytoma includes stereotactic biopsy to verify the tumor, the histology, followed by surgery for curative intent. So what do you do? You, you go for a biopsy, you name first your tumor, uh, which type of tumor is that one, then you plan for, 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 for surgery. So in a study examining the mortality rate of uh, complete resection of benign thalamic astrocytomas in 26 children, the procedure was found to be associated with improved prognosis uh, when 
post-operative MRI showed no residual tumor, but was associated with only 7.7% .7 mortality rate. So surgical resection of bilateral infiltrative astrocytoma of the thalamus is difficult to achieve, and biopsy for histologic diagnosis is preferred. These patients usually, they have a very poor, a poor outcome despite adjuvant radiotherapy or chemotherapy. So anatomic considerations are important because the thalamus is adjacent to critical structures. Like Dr. Natalie mentioned, the, when you are going to, we are doing a, a, an approach to thalamus, you have to know very well your anatomy before you go there. Because you know, anteriorly, the thalamus is bounded by the foramen of Moro uh, and posteriorly by the posterior commissure. And it is also um, uh, bounded superiorly by the stria medullaris and inferiorly by the hypothalamic sulcus. Finally, the thalamus is medially bound uh, by the third ventricle and laterally bound by the internal capsule, as we know. So there is uh, this vein, the terminal vein, which lies in the groove between the thalamus and the caudic uh, nucleus. That vein serves as a landmark for the position of the internal capsule the time you are going, uh, you are doing an approach to, to thalamus. So factors that must be considered by neurosurgeons include before you go for surgery, include MRI appearance of the tumor, extent of tumor involvement, regions of enhancement, evidence of hydrocephalus, and relationship of the tumor to vital uh, vascular structures surrounding the, 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 the thalamus. Then the surgical approaches that have been used with endoscopic or stereostatic guidance include transcalosal interhemispheric, infratentorial supracerebellar, and transsylvian, uh, transinsular approaches. So surgical resection can be performed while minimizing mobility using concomitant neural navigation and intraoperative monitoring of the corticospinal tract. Uh, so if the patient is extremist because of an elevated intracranial pressure secondary to hydrocephalus, as a surgeon, you should perform emergent CSF drainage. And the most rapid method is to place an intraventricular drain. So if surgery for gross total resection is planned, the surgeon can now attempt to win the EVD postoperatively because the normal CSF flow is sometimes restored. Uh, if only a biopsy is planned, a CSF blockade persists, the surgeon can perform an endoscopic dead ventriculostomy or place a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Ventricular peritoneal shunt usually uh, people are placing it, but it's, it's no longer recommended in uh, obstructive hydrocephalus because the moment you put your ventricular peritoneal shunt, if, if you are dealing with a malignant tumor, you might spread um, tumor cells to the abdomen. If you put the ventricular peritoneal shunt, you might spread tumor cells to the abdomen. Uh, also, there are advantages and disadvantages of putting a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Other advocate for for an external ventricular drain. And also, the another disadvantage of uh, ventricular peritoneal drain is, like I, I used to put it as a joke, but it's, 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 it's a real disadvantage. You put your shunt, the patient improves from raised ICP, uh, and the patient will disappear for actual operation. Because you relieve the pressure, the patient is free from symptoms, and the patient won't show up uh, for the actual operation to remove the tumor. So post-operative imaging is obtained to evaluate the extent of resection and the residual tumor. Then adjuvant radio, uh, radiation and the chemotherapy for high-grade gliomas are required. This, this study also, uh, which was done uh, involving 57 patients, uh, despite surgical resection and multimodal therapy, the median survival length remained 73 weeks. In contrast, children who have low-grade gliomas that have been resected in their entire can be observed serially for tumor recurrence. Then uh, for partially resected or unresected low-grade thalamic tumors, the timing of additional therapy is controversial. Most surgeons advocate for wait-and-see approach. 
often adjuvant therapy can be delayed until signs uh, of clinical worsening or radiographic growth. So in one series, in one series looking uh, at 128 children with subtotal resection of low-grade gliomas, 58% had no evidence of tumor progression seven years after diagnosis, despite undergoing uh, no additional therapy. Furthermore, there was no difference in survival in those children that did receive immediate post-operative radiotherapy and those that not receive it. So given the increase in data regarding the detrimental effect of radiation on children, many centers recommend chemotherapy as frontline adjuvant therapy in children with progressive low-grade gliomas. And one combination uh, that has shown promise is a, a combination of carboplatin and vancristine, which has been shown to generate a 68% three-year progression free survival rate. Unfortunately, 40% of children experience uh, hypersensitivity reactions with the uh, carboplastin. These patients are often started on a regimen of 6 thioglyne procarbazine, uh, lomustine, uh, dibromodulcito, and vancristine, which has shown a 45% three-year progression-free survival rate. So that was just a short overview on thalamic gliomas. Thank you for your understanding. Those are my references. Uh, since we are talking about thalamic, I said I love you with all my hypothalamus. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's great. Uh, I love with all my hypothalamus. That's great. Thank, yes. you very, thank you very much, Dr. Kabul, for taking the time from your busy schedule. And I'd like to open it up to for the panelists to comment or uh, say any questions. How are you doing, Marco? I'm uh, quite fine. Uh, my um, uh, my shift is finished. In fact, I'm uh, in, a, in my in my street for uh, for home uh, and uh, close to the lake. I can see. Uh. Wow! <laughs> yeah, is that your background, or is that is that your real background there? No, no, no. no. Is is actually real? Is actually oh, no, real? Okay, I thought, I thought you put there, it up there. There, through through both. Through, through water, through lake. So outside the hospital, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's actually outside the hospital, uh, 100 meters from the hospital. The oh, hospital. okay, just finishing your shift. Very good. Yeah, yeah, and uh, now I had some uh, some dinner. Uh, I'll take advantage, John, to congratulate you with uh, both uh, Kabul and both the colleagues. Uh, and uh, sorry, my, uh, in terms of name, person, I'm uh, a disaster, but uh, they are very great panel and a great uh, uh, complete presentation about thalamus and uh, pathology. And above all, as it just a uh, great thing in this panel, the uh, surgical approach is a uh, very complete uh, so congratulations for both you as uh, for both you uh. thank you thank you marco serge any comments or questions for uh, dr cabulo well um i think thank you uh, dr cabulo for this presentation it was very comprehensive uh, but my question is not to him but rather to to marco um how how often do you uh, operate on thalamic lesion? Mm, well, uh, that's obviously depend by the uh, diagnosis uh, uh, in a, on MRI. If I see there is a, a malignant aspect, uh, uh, of course, my, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, of course, uh, I move for, uh, first of all, biopsy, and then I consider eventually the, uh, eventually the, the surgery. Um, but uh, uh, usually, uh, I, uh, I I I consider first of all uh, the uh, uh, the patients uh, is a young patient. Of course, uh, we need to give uh, our best to uh, uh, to do something uh, in terms of care. Uh, but uh, I think the, if you uh, don't have any. Um, uh, any diagnosis about the, the lesion just perform biopsy uh, usually you uh, you have the opportunity to do because as just uh, I like Kabulo 
sometimes uh, thalamic lesions are associated with hydrocephalus. So you can, uh, the first uh, uh, problem is to uh, save the patient from uh, acute hydrocephalus, performing uh, uh, third ventriculostomy or uh, uh, performing ventricular peritoneal shunt. But if you have the opportunity to do endoscopically uh, guided uh, third, uh, ventriculostomy, you have the opportunity to, uh, to get a biopsy and then check if there is the, uh, how the sort of lesion is and then uh, decide the best surgery, even because uh, it is not a, uh, actually a simple surgery you need. As just uh, I liked the colleagues at the first panel, uh, you need to uh, study the, the best approach. Sometimes uh, I, uh, only one approach is not uh, sufficient. You need to move for the approach uh, in a second surgery. So uh, personally, so, I... Uh, I the... thank, thank, thank you for that. I have a question though. Go ahead. A question? Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Tell me. No, I had a question about, uh, let's say if you have a lesion that is mainly on the medial aspect of the thalamus uh, and it's abutting on the third ventricle, uh, how do you approach that? Do you, will you approach it through, uh, let's say, an intraventricular approach to biopsy the tumor? Definitely, definitely is the more uh, uh, smooth approach because you can perform an interhemispheric uh, using the neural navigation. You have the uh, limits, the boundaries of tumor, and uh, it, with this approach, you just uh, go to the third ventricle and you see the uh, you have the thalamus with the lesion, and is a is the best approach. Uh, in a in lesion as you showed medially at the thalamus. If they are more lateral, you can also consider the uh, transcorodial approach uh, better than, uh, uh, than uh, trans uh, callosal. But uh, they are a uh, um, uh, good approach, and uh, above Chloe, you don't get uh, throughout the, the brain, so uh, they are very. Uh, I don't. I don't want to use the term uh, uh, straightforward, but a very. Uh, I I think uh, more gentle than a transcortical. Even with the transcortical, you have uh, brain head mass or the uh, the window for surgery. Sometimes is uh, uh, there is a, some obstacle because there is brain head mass. So the best approach is of course uh, transcalosa, and then you can consider even a transcorridal approach if it is more lateral. That's my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Marco. Sorry, in the same uh, way, I want to ask you. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just reminding to the panelists that Dr. Marco is a consultant neurosurgeon in Italy. He was recently at Mayo Clinic where he spent months, he spent days there. He just went back, I think, one week ago, went back to Italy. So he spent more days uh, at Mayo Clinic. So, Dr. Marco, I have a question. The question is, you get your thalamic lesion, then you decide to do your biopsy endoscopically. But yeah. so far, there is no active hydrocephalus. You go and do your biopsy. Will you take, since you are doing it endoscopically, will you take advantage already at that time? You do your ETV, or you won't do ETV. You wait the time you get hydrocephalus for you to go back and do it. Let's say it's a... Uh, uh, and you mm. Oh well, actually, uh, I um, if there is no hydrocephalus, I won't perform a AVT. I just uh, put an extra ventricular drainage, and then when I I, uh, I decide for surgery, I have all the opportunity to perform a AVT. Uh, um, uh, on the contrary, uh, I can also convert in a ventricular peritoneal shunt. Uh, or, or uh, get back and perform external ventricular drainage. Usually, uh, I don't uh, attempt to uh, put, uh, perform external ventricular drainage if there is no hydrocephalus. Uh, even because uh, sometimes, uh, it's my opinion, I don't know if there is some work in literature, if there is no adequate pressure, <laughs> uh, sometimes it can happen even that uh, external ventricular drainage, uh, uh, third ventriculostomy fail, and close sometimes happen uh, if there is no uh, a good pressure that keep open the 
stop, this, uh, stop me. Mm. So uh, I don't know if you, what was your opinion, Kabulo. What do you usually you used to do in this case? Okay, uh, we really get those cases, and uh, it depends now. Either we were we are planning to to go for surgery. Then, of course, you go for surgery. Then, during surgery, you do your phrasal bell, you put your external ventricular drain, you remove the tumor. Then, you can win off the patient of EVD after four or five days post op. Or, you okay. are not going for surgery, you are not going to remove the tumor, but you opt for ventricular peritoneal shunt. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very You're good. Welcome. Um, hey, go ahead, Ulrich. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. So my, my, my question is for Dr. Kabulo. Um, before I ask the question, thank you so much for your presentation. I mean, it's been wonderful, exceptional as always, and thank you for being here for the, the younger colleagues. So the question is about um, operating uh, neuro oncology cases in Africa, and you you, you sort of mentioned it. Um, a lot of the time, you try to relieve the patient with an EVD, for example. And because the patient feels okay, the patient, the patient goes away. So when these kind of patients come back, um, how, is, how do you plan the management? Because obviously things have changed around the brain, the structures, because the, the, this patient has been draining for so long. So how do you plan these kind of cases? Thank you, thank you, Ilrik. Actually, after putting a VT shunt, it will be even easier to perform surgery because the brain is no longer under pressure. So you put, that why even the time you are operating, you can put your an external, uh, external ventricular drain just to relieve pressure. Then you go to avoid brain enation, external enation, the time you're doing your craniotomy. So if you put your uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt, you plan after two weeks, three weeks, you go now for the tumor, you will find the brain relaxed. It will allow you to go in and remove the tumor. It's actually even better. But okay. the only thing, it's like what I was saying, there are disadvantages of VP shunt. You put your, your shunt, you can spread the tumor cells if it's a malignant tumor. The shunt can block or you can have infection. You know the enemy of shunt is infection. You can actually get shunt infection, which is now going to stop you to continue to do now the actual operation. Or the patient might get better and disappear from follow-up. So those are the disadvantages. That's why other advocate for external ventricular drain at the same setting, the time they are removing the tumor, and you keep it for four to five days, then you remove. Unless the patient requires a ventricular peritoneal shunt after removing the, 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 the tumor, then you can go back and put the ventricular peritoneal shunt. But after putting your EBD, if the patient is okay, there's no need for ventricular peritoneal shunt. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, yes, yes, thank you so much. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, maybe, can, can I just add something uh, to uh, okay. Carry on, Dr. Kamba. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Kabula. I think that, 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 is, uh, that, that was a great answer. Uh, but also as, as well, when those patients do come back, um, as you were saying, the disease process will have changed. Uh, if they come back, uh, it means either there's shunt malfunction and uh, there's need to work up the patient again for, for, for possible surgery. So we have to then start all over again. Uh, it's easier when you have, uh, you have put in your shunt and then uh, you plan for surgery uh, almost immediately after. But um, as the case is usually, you know, you put the shunt, the patient feels better, they go away for, you know, for a long time until they get an, a complication and then they come back. So uh, in that case, you have to restart all over again. And uh, Ilri, here yeah, we, are, we are lucky as a neurosurgeon because Dr. Mba's wife, she's a specialist radiation oncologist. So every time we are done with the operating, even if there's a residual tumor, we want to send the patient for radiation. Uh, his wife is there, so we don't suffer, we don't sweat. <laughs> we just transfer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, very good. 
Are you there, Dr. Kabula? Yes, I'm there. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, there's any more comments or questions uh, before we close it up? Uh, yeah, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Dr. Kabulu. Uh, just to say, uh, Dr. Kabulu, Dr. Kabulu supervised my uh, my presentation, so I wanted to thank him for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Natalie. <laughs> Okay, very good. Stick around. We'll end the broadcast formally. And thanks, everyone, for participating. And thanks, Dr. Cabullo, for leading the charge. Thank you so much, Dr. Bennett. Maybe you can end the registered whatever. Since you are recording, you can end the, the record. Yes. Then we speak about other things. Sure. Okay, thank you, everybody. Bye.